Hey, good day, everyone. Um, Alan Clegg here, and uh, we are here for number nine of the uh, 10 presentations on DNSSEC. Uh, glad to see uh, a lot of people here with us today. I uh, hope everybody is well and uh, staying healthy and safe. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started with today's presentation. We're going to talk a little bit today about key rollover and uh, both uh, an, a a couple of different ways of uh, automating a uh, key rollover. I know we talked about this quite a bit uh, last week um, in uh, explaining exactly what the key rollover did and how you could go about doing it manually. But as I mentioned last week, there were a number of things that you could actually do that would cause some problems uh, that would, would actually cause your DNSX sign zone to not be able to be validated. And a lot of those things had to do with the human being in the loop. It's never, uh, you know, it's never necessarily safe for a human to be handling something that can take down your entire infrastructure. So with that, let's talk a little bit about Bind and how it can do automation of the key rollovers that we talked about last week. Well, I'm gonna start off going back two weeks and talking a little bit about signature expiration. If you remember, Every, uh, every uh, resource record uh, set in your zone is going to have a signature associated with it. And that signature is going to be created from a key, from a DNS key, the private portion. And then it is going to be used uh, to create a, an RR signature, an RR sig, that goes with the RR set that is then used by the validating recursive server to make sure that the data hasn't been modified in transit. Now, signatures have expiration dates. Unlike the keying material, there are hard signature expiration dates, as we saw two weeks ago. Um, those are actually embedded in the resource record signature uh, uh, DNS record. The signatures must be regenerated well before they expire to make sure that we don't run into any of the issues that we talked about last week about caching. You don't want a signature to expire while it is in the cache of another uh, server somewhere. Now, most servers these days will actually recover from that because they'll recognize that the signature is out of date. They will attempt to get a new signature from the authoritative server or from the upstream server. And if it is able to then do validation, all is well and good, but it's better to go ahead and have your signatures regenerated before they expire, preferably between a third and a quarter of the remaining lifetime of those signatures. Now, for dynamic zones, signatures start to expire at different times. You need to remember that if you run DNSSEC sign zone at a given time on a zone does not have existing signatures, it's going to generate signatures that will have the exact exception and expiration dates. Now, on a dynamic zone, that is going to be um, and I'm getting a notification here that my internet connection is unstable, and I apologize for that. I will do my best to, uh, to go slower. That's not going to help any at all, is it? Anyway, the jitter, uh, so the signatures will all have the same uh, expiration date um, if you run DNSSEC uh, sign zone uh, with no signatures already in the zone. If you have a dynamic zone, then you are going to have um, some uh, some randomness in the expiration times automatically uh, because anytime a, a, a resource record is modified, obviously the uh, signature for that resource record is regenerated. And in addition, any related uh, signatures will also be regenerated. So for example, if, the, uh, if a zone is modified, uh, then obviously uh, the Alan? Uh, way record needs to have integer regenerated as well. So Alan? also to a scenario using DNSX sign zone. Yes. Can I just ask you to repeat yourself because you dropped out there for uh you know, about a minute and a half or so, or 
uh, so you were you were we heard you up through um, your explanation that um, with dynamic zones the signatures are going to keep um, uh, regenerating right. as the zone changes okay but everything after that we lost sure. Okay, well, basically that was the end of it. I, anything I said after that was just rambling, uh, but that's what most of my presentations are anyway. So, so that's all good. And I apologize for the uh, for the outage, um, as if I could do anything about it at all. Uh, so, the, what I was saying was that a a sign zone obviously can have some jitter um, inserted into it automatically um, with the dash J option on DNSX sign zone. And when that occurs, um, you know, your signatures will not all expire at the same time. Um, automating the re-signing uh, by using a dynamic zone is a very, very nice thing. Otherwise, make absolutely sure that you re-sign the zones a number of times. You know, I, I actually used to do it twice a day. Um, and with existing signatures, um, in the zone, it only regenerates the ones that need to be re-signed, those within one third of, the, of their expiration. So again, this is with the expiration of signatures. Keying material itself does not have any expiration. So the keys, you can generate a key, and we talked about this last week, how often you should generate a new key. Some of you will never generate a new key. Some of you will do it just for fun. And you know you'll you'll figure out when the most opportune time. The best thing to do at this point is to do your um, uh, key generation to make sure that you remember how to regenerate a key. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about the rolling of the key. Now, last week we actually did talk about how to. Uh, figure out on how to manually uh, do the key uh, rollover. So you had to go in and, you know, figure out when you were going to have a key rollover. You were going to um, uh, generate a new key. Uh, you were going to figure out when you were going to actually insert that into the zone, whether you were going to sign with, you know, both the new key and the old key, depending on this being a pre-publication or a double signing, uh, 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 you know, a key rollover. Well, so bind actually has a bit of that already cooked in. So if you have a, uh, the option auto DNSSEC maintain in your configuration, and if your key files have a dynamic or have a, a key, a timing material, the, uh, the, the metadata for timing, in the key file, then bind is able to automatically do the right thing with your keying material. It's going to be able to say, well, I see that this time is coming up. So at this given time, the key says it should be inserted into the zone. I will insert it into the zone. When it says it should be used for signing, I am actually going to use that key for signing. And all of these can now be managed by using options on the DNSSEC key gen command from the command line. And we'll see a little bit later the, uh, the, uh, uh, the CASP tool that's built into bind that actually does a lot more of this for you completely automatically. So one of the other really nifty things uh, about DNSSEC key gen, again, this is prior to 9.16 when we got the, uh, uh, the key and signing policy tool in place, um, DNSSEC keygen could actually be used to create a successor key to an existing key. So you could tell DNSSEC keygen to, hey, you know, this key already exists. Look at its metadata and from there figure out what the new timing should be on this key. So let's look at how we go about doing this. If you think about the little diagram that we, uh, that we used last week. Uh, there were, you know, there were three clocks at the top. There was the time that we inserted a new key. There was the time that we maybe, uh, you know, started signing with either both of the keys or only with one of the keys. And then there was a time that we removed the keys. Well, let's look at those and figure out how we can actually put into terms that work 
for our perspective of human beings trying to do a key rollover. And so the times that were given, the times that are available for you to modify in the DNSSEC key gen uh, command from the command line are the publication time. And that's the time at which the public portion of the given key is inserted into the zone. Now that is again, only the insertion of the key into the zone, not when the key is actually used to sign the zone. Then there is the activation date. And that's the time that we are going to use the associated private key to sign the zone data. The revocation key, we're not going to really talk about very much because that's used in the RFC 5011 um, automation of, um, of um, uh, trust anchors. So we'll kind of ignore that one for right now because you're not going to really use that one as far as key rollovers in the, in the, normal, in the normal stance. The next one is the retirement date or the inactivation date. This is when the private key is no longer going to be used to sign the data. Now, this does not remove the key from the zone. All it does is it makes sure that the given key is not used to sign the data, the authoritative data in the zone. And then the final item is the deletion date. And this is the date at which, and of course it's date and time. All of these are, are specific down to the second. So it's not just tomorrow, it's tomorrow at this specific time. And this, the deletion date is when the public key is going to be deleted from the zone. So at that point, the keying material will no longer appear in the DNS key resource record set. And of course, each of these things is going to trigger a re-signing event because obviously publication inserts the key into the zone. The activation date is actually a, a, you know, a signing event unto itself. Hey, use this key in addition to any other keys that are also active to do the signing. The retirement, again, re-sign the zone, but only with the active keys, not with the one that has just retired. And then the deletion date is going to be the time and date at which the item, the uh, DNS key is removed. And that is going to force another signing event based on the active keys that are in the zone. So the way that we use these is actually on the command line with the commands DNSSEC key gen, which we've already seen, and DNSSEC set time, which is actually used to modify these keying events or modify these timing values without actually generating the key. So if we run DNSSEC key gen, we can specify dash uppercase P and that will set the publication date for the key. The default for the dash uppercase P, the publication, is right now. Uh, the dash A uses the act, it sets, allows you to set the activation date. And again, okay, so I'm seeing a comment in the chat. I'm hoping that's not that I'm dropping out again. Okay. Oh no, it's okay. Never mind. Okay, good. I'm really, really paranoid now because I really don't want to lose any information, but I also don't want to repeat things if you're able to hear it okay. So anyway, the dash A is setting the activation date. And by default, that is set to the publication date. So if you specify neither dash P um, nor the dash A, then they're both the same and it is right now. It is the time at which you are running the DNSSEC key gen uh, application. Dash R sets the revocation date. Again, that is something that uh, we will uh, not discuss even, you know, not even next week, uh, because again, that is RFC 5011 uh, related, and you can uh, go out and, and search for that if you're actually doing a 5011 rollover. Uh, the dash uppercase I sets the retirement or inactivation date, um, and it defaults to never, because by default, keys are basically meant to be used or, or in the way that we generate them, we don't have a hard set date or time at which they are inactivated, which they are retired or which they are deleted from the zone. So the dash uppercase D sets the deletion date. And again, it defaults to never. 
Now the format of these dates and offsets is either a year, month, day, or a, a year, month, day, hour, minute, second, if you want to get down to the, the very fine-grained uh, time of the event occurring. But it can also be an offset from now. So you can say now plus one hour. And that allows you to do things not necessarily based on a hard date, but on an event. So you're generating a key using a script, instead of having to figure out, you know, what the exact time and day is, you know, two, uh, two years and one month and a day from now, you can actually just say now plus two Y, one month, two days or whatever I said. So unfortunately, because we have suffixes of Y and MO for year and month, not all years have the same number of days and not all months have the same number of days. But as far as DNSSEC key gen is concerned and the DNSSEC set time, all years have 365 days and all months have 30 days. So we don't take into account leap years and we don't really uh, take into account how many specific days are in a month. We make the assumption that all months are, or make the, make the statement that all months are 30 days and that all years are 365. So, DNSSEC set time, and again, these were introduced in 9.6 and 9.7. Um, 9.7 introduced the DNSSEC set time, which allows you to edit and print the metadata. So you can say DNSSEC set time, uh, dash A, dash uppercase A, and then give it an activation date, and then give it a specific key. You give it the name of the key file, and it will set the activation date on that specific key. And then when you, when bind recognizes, when bind, you know, comes around to its regular uh, uh, interval for checking uh, keying material, it will see that that activation date has changed. It will then put it into its scheduler to make that occur at the correct time. And again, DNSSEC revoke uh, used to revoke a key RFC 5011, not going to, uh, not going to talk about that. Uh, but it is something that is available to you if you need it. So when I'm creating an initial zone signing key, and I'm giving this a lot of options that I normally would not, because again, zone signing keys for my, you know, my own personal zone, I really don't roll them over that often, especially back when it was manual. Um, but this is how I would go about setting it. Um, I can go in and say, as the example shows, DNSSEC uh, key gen, dash A, and then the algorithm number. So in this case, I'm using RSA SHA-256. Dash P, the publication date, is now. But again, that is the default. So I could have left that out. But as an example, I'm, I'm giving it here. Dash A, the activation date. When should this key be used to sign the zone? Again, I'm specifying it as the current time and date. Dash I, for the retirement or inactivation, I'm saying do this now, but 90 minutes from now. So in an hour and a half, this key will be automatically inactivated. It will no longer be used to sign the zone by bind, recognizing the metadata in the key material. And then the dash uppercase D says that it is going to be deleted in 120 minutes. So in two hours, this key is no longer going to appear in the zone whatsoever. And then uh, the last item there on the line is the name of the zone for which we are creating the key. When I hit return on that, it goes out and it generates the key pair. We see some dots and some, some pluses. And then we see uppercase K, lowercase, the name of the zone, collect.com, plus 008, which is RSA SHA-256 and then 38535, which is the key ID. That's that the number that identifies the specific key within the specific algorithm that we are using or that we can use. Uh, we'll, we'll, that's the information that shows up in other places so that you can link the key material together with the signatures. So then I'm running the command DNSSEC set time dash P 
and all. So this is, I want to print all of the timing material. And then again, I give it the name of the key. So in this case, uppercase K, clegg.com, plus 008, plus 38535. And I see the creation time, which is the time that the key was actually generated. It has nothing to do with when it's going to be used, but it's when we ran the command. Then we see the publication time and the activation time, which we set to now, which when I ran this command was November 26th of last year. And then the activation, I'm sorry, and then the revocation is not set because we aren't doing an RFC 5011. The inactivation time we see is the current time, which was uh, 2316 plus 90 minutes. So in this case, it's midnight, 46. Um, so it's the next day at 46 minutes after midnight. And then the deletion time or the, yeah, is another, uh, you know, 30 minutes after that. So we see that 46 plus 30 is uh, down into 116 AM. So when bind sees that, and we have the, uh, uh, the auto maintain, uh, you know, DNSSEC uh, auto uh, maintain in our configuration options, then bind is going to know where to find the keying material. It's going to periodically look at the keying material and it's going to see all of this metadata and it's going to do the right thing with the zone. So that's all well and good. So now I've created my ZSK. Now I'm going to have to generate my KSK as well. And you can, if you want to, and if you trust the, you know, your speed and the, the times and dates at which things occur, you can set these times on keying material as well. The problem with setting it on keying material is, as I specified last week, the fact that you have to talk to the zone maintainer of the parent zone. Because remember, you can't go in and modify the key signing key the only key signing key in your zone without inserting a new DS record that's going to match up with the new key. And if you delete the existing key signing key, the one that's being used to sign the DNS key resource record set before the new DS record appears, then your zone is going to go away. So at this point, I personally would not go around setting uh, inactivation and deletion timers on a key signing key because I don't know exactly when those things are going to happen. Now what I can do is I can use DNSSEC keygen, set a publication time for the new key signing key, set an activation time of none, set an inactivation time and a deletion time, just leave those off, and they're also going to be none. And then when I make that key material visible to bind, it's going to say, oh, I need to publish this, but gee, look at that, I don't need to sign anything with it. So now I'm able, I have my emergency standby key. Remember last week we talked about that, the fact that if your key material was ever stolen, then you would have this uh, standby key. You can then make that key actually active for signing by going in and doing a DNSSEC set time dash A and then whatever time you actually want it to occur and then give it the name of the key. That keying metadata is modified when bind sees that it's been changed, it automatically is going to start signing with that keying material. You can then send that DS record up to the parent once you see that the DS record is modified in the parent, you can go in and use the dash I and the dash D to get rid of the old key signing key. And you never have to actually go in and modify the zone file or go in and add or delete any information by hand. So even though I'm not going to set the dash I and the dash D when I create the key signing key, I may very well use it using DNSSEC set time to make the key events and make the key rollover occur in a semi-automated fashion. 
Now, obviously, you can go in and you can create an automation that says generate the DS record, send the DS record up to the parent, and then sit around and watch for that DS record to appear, and then automate the DNSSEC set time to do the dash I and the dash D on the older key, and it works just fine. Now, I said the DNSSEC set or the DNSSEC key gen could be used to create a successor key. Now, this is done by using a dash uppercase S, and that specifies the previous, otherwise the currently active key, and then the activation of the key that's being created is automatically set to the retirement time of the previous key. You can also use a dash lowercase i option to specify a pre-publication time, which says that this new key, the publication time is going to be set to the activation time of the previous key minus this amount of time. So it's going to appear in the zone a specified length of time prior to the other key going away. It's going to be pre-published. So how do we use this? Well, we can go in and say DNS set key gen dash uppercase S. So we're creating a successor key. Then we provide the name of the key that we are going to be succeeding. So in this case, we take the key that we had we just created. So the 38535 key ID. We say that we want this key to appear 30 minutes, the new one that we're creating, to, to appear 30 minutes prior to the old one going away. We want this one to uh, be uh, uh, retired or inactivated in 90 minutes and then deactive or deleted in 120 minutes. It then generates the key pair. You now see that we have a new key that is 38229. And when I look at the keying, uh, the, the timing metadata on that key, what I see is the creation, the publication, and the activation times that are all related not to, well, not creative, obviously, publication and activation, that are not related to right now, but they are related to the key that we are following. So all of these publication and activation times are related to the 38535 key that we created in the previous step. Same with the inactivation and deletion. Those are going to be based on the key that we are succeeding. So again, the dash I says, when does the previous key expire? And then pub publish this key, dash I time units in advance of that event occurring. So this is all well and good. And we're seeing a lot of things that make it a whole lot easier. But gee, it still looks like a whole lot of work on, on you know, manual work. Well, so you can automate things a lot for ZSKs. Because now you can write a script that can be written to create the keys in advance of their need. For KSK rollovers, it's still very dangerous to do this uh, completely automated because the DS record has to appear in parent and the interface to the parent dictates how that's going to be done. You can go ahead and create the cron job, creating the new KSK publication and activation, but then use DNSSEC set time to modify the inactivation and deletion times once the DS record appears. There is a script already written for you in the contrib directory of the bind distribution called dnssec-keyset. And what this allows you to do is create a batch of keys and it uses a lot of the same options. I'm gonna refer you back to looking at the code before you actually make use of this. But what, I highly, what you can do is you can, as it shows here, dnssec uh, key set dash A, and I give it the algorithm number, or the algorithm name, the zone that I'm creating the keys for, and then a number of keys. So what this is going to do is it's going to create keys zero through nine, base zero, yay. And it's going to make them such that they overlap and they don't allow this zone to ever go without um, an active ZSK. 
Now, you can give a lot of the other options the same as you do on DNSSEC uh, uh, KeyGen to DNSSEC KeySet. This allows you to generate a whole bunch of keys in advance. So that's all well and good. But now you have, gee, a whole bunch of uh, keys sitting around in advance. If you're concerned about your system security, then obviously you are probably not going to want to generate a large number of keys in advance on the system that is anywhere related to being able to get to it from the public internet. But this is one way that you can go about doing it. But I'm going to show you a much, much neater way, and that's with 9.16 and the, uh, the key and signing policy tool. But we'll see that in just a minute because there's one other thing that I want to talk to you first. There is also a tool called DNSSEC-Coverage. And what this is going to do is it is going to take all of the keying material for a given or in a given directory, and it's going to look at all of the keys and make sure that there are no holes in the keying metadata that are going to cause a zone outage. So in this case, I am in the zone where I created all of that, that whole big batch of keys. And I'm going to say I want to run it for the next 1,200 minutes. Or actually, I'm not. Uh, wow. I don't remember what the dash M option does, but I'm sure somebody can find it and uh, post it in the chat there. Um, but what this is going to do is it's going to go out and it's going to look at the keying material and it's going to show me all of the keys and the fact that they are published, activated, deactivated, deleted automatically. And it's going to show me that there are no ridiculous. Oh yeah. Thank you, Francisco. Uh, yes. The dash M I, I have, because we're not actually giving this thing access to the zone data, we have to make sure that remember when last week we talked about the fact that um, uh, for the for a key rollover you had to make sure that uh, you didn't get rid of uh, key information um, until the longest uh, possible TTL in the zone. Well, DNSSEC coverage doesn't have access to the zone data, so what you're going to have to do is provide it there on the command line, and it uses that to make sure that you're not going to be having any signatures that are going to be outside of the uh, coverage of any of the given keys. So we see we run that and it goes through and it says until Wednesday, October 30th um, of 2024, uh, we have a good batch of keys. We see no errors. However, the error now shows that there are no zone signing keys after this event. So Wednesday, October 30th of 2024, before then, we better generate some new zone signing keys that are going to be active um, at that point. So this is a nice little tool that, again, if you're doing the generation of keys to some extent manually by using DNSSEC KeyGen, then this is going to be something that you're going to find useful. So now the magic happens. And what I'd like to do is, is right off the bat, say that the, uh, the primary author of the key and signing policy uh, tool that's within BIND, uh, Matthijs Meeking, is actually here in the, uh, in the audience with us today. He's one of the presenters. So uh, if you have some really in-depth questions, uh, he is available. And if I completely botch up the explanation, he's going to be able to fix it. So, Let's move forward and see how badly I can do and how well he can do. So you've seen that, that we really come down to a lot of making sure that the keying material is available, make sure that signatures overlap. And when we do a key rollover, we need to make sure that all of those times, you know, the publication, the activation, the deletion, or the uh, inactivation, the deletion, all occur such that no, you, you never run without a key and you always have the matching keys and the signatures available in the zone. So what has been implemented in bind 9.16 and moving forward is the key and signing policy tool. So what this allows us to do is in our namedy configuration in the namedy.com file, we're able to create multiple DNSSEC policy options. 
And what this allows us to do is in these options, we are able to say a given key signing key has a given lifetime and has an algorithm of, and then we give the name. So in this case, we're creating a ZSK that's going to be automatically rolled every 365 days using ECDSA 256 and a key signing key that is not ever going to be automatically rolled and it's going to use the same algorithm. So we've now defined a policy named one year ZSK. I now go into my zone definitions and I have zone information, you know, all of my, my standard, you know, uh, type primary, uh, the location of the file and all that good stuff. And then I'm able to say DNSSEC policy, one year ZSK. I don't ever have to run DNSSEC signs or uh, DNSSEC signs on or DNSSEC key gen because bind is going to see this statement and it's going to say, oh, this zone is supposed to have a zone signing key. It's supposed to have a key signing key. They aren't there, so let me go ahead and generate them. I see that the timing parameters are there. Um, I also see the algorithm that's supposed to be used, so I'm gonna go ahead and generate that key right off the bat. Don't need to do this um, by hand. The keys are generated, stored, and used completely automatically. This is the one-click button to turn on DNSSEC for a given zone. Now, ZSK rollover is automatic based on the lifetime of the key. So there are 365 days. We're going to have that key automatically regenerated. The new key is going to be put in. The, the uh, 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 expiration or the, uh, the uh, inactivation date of one and the activation date of the other are going to be the same. And so it's going to automatically click over and the correct thing is going to happen as far as the creation of signatures. Now, at this moment, at this moment, the key signing key rollover is not automated. Um, MSEC 3 is not supported, but these are things that are going to be implemented in uh, future uh, releases of BIND. Uh, the, they're planned at this point. So that includes uh, the CDS, the child DS record, and the child DNS key records that are supposed to be visible you know, to the parent so that when you generate this key, this new keying information, you know, having that automatically inserted into your zone, watching for the parent DS record to take advantage of the CDS or the CDNS key, and then having the key signing key automatically rolled out when that occurs, that is a future event. So I'm that, to, that, to that break and Matthias and the team are working on and uh, I think somebody just unmuted. So Matthijs, did you have something? Yes, yes. I'm just going to correct you that uh, oh. uh, the DNSSEC policy actually uh, publishes the CDS and CDNS key uh, on time automatically. So whenever it is ready to publish the DS in the parent zone, BIND will include the CDS and CDNS key records at that time in the zone. Oh, well, fantastic. So we're already now, as, as soon as we can get all of the parent zones to actually take advantage of that, then we'll have something that is, that is absolutely astronomical. So we do have the ability, so the, the, so the CDS and the CDNS key are going to be, or actually are automatically inserted into your zone so that when and if your parent takes advantage of those, this is going to be a, a nearly completely automated rollover system. And that's absolutely fantastic. So when you use the CASP tool, one of the things that you're going to recognize is that there is a new file that's going to be generated with each key pair. Now, all of this information is for the internal use of bind. So I am providing it here just so that you're aware that this is here but it's not going to be something that you're going to really want to go in and muck around with. Um, the, the uppercase K zone name, uh, you know, key algorithm, uh, key ID uh, dot state file is going to be created. 
and it's going to contain all the metadata that's currently in the dot private file and it's also going to contain new key state and transition data that is used by bind in its automation of the rollover procedure so here i'm just going to give you the uh, a, a sample of what this looks like so the state of key 33330 uh, for the zone example.com we see the algorithm number we see the key length we see its lifetime we see its predecessor key so we, we should somewhere find a key 17530 and then we see that this can be used as a key signing key or a zone signing key and we see all of the other information and a bunch of other stuff that I do not have documented, uh, but I'm sure will be of great use inside Bind to make sure that the key rollover takes place uh, as expected. So this is one for a key signing key. And then the one for the zone signing key does not contain all of the additional metadata, but it still does contain the publication activation and retirement information uh, for the given key. So here is a slide that I don't have any freaking clue as to what it does, but if you have any questions, again, Matthijs is here, so I will, I will be happy to, uh, to hand this over, but I am gonna continue on to talk about something called a negative trust anchor. And negative trust anchors are something that are very controversial because it allows you on behalf of someone else to say, I don't want to do validation of your zone. And the reason that this is important is that there have been rather major zones in, you know, all around the world, but I've seen a bunch of them here in the US that have been broken inadvertently and have caused some rather major inconveniences. I uh, don't know if, if any of you remember, but I, I think it was one of the Mars missions, one of the very early Mars missions. Uh, NASA was doing a live video feed of the lander you know, coming down or some major event. And it just so happened that their zone went bogus during that event. And there was a lot of, you know, oh my gosh, you know, yeah, it's not really, they're not really landing on Mars. They're really landing on, you know, somewhere in Arizona and a bunch of people freaked out. But how do you go about saying, hey, you know, NASA just broke their DNSSEC. I don't want to completely turn off DNSSEC validation, but I know that that zone is probably going to get better. And even if it doesn't get better, I still need my users to be able to get to it. Now, one of the other ones that broke, also a .gov site, was the IRS. And of course, when you're not able to pick up your internal revenue service forms, you're not able to do your taxes, well, that may not be a bad thing, but I don't think that their auditors are gonna understand, well, I couldn't get the form because DNSSEC was broken. So as a provider of recursive services, one of the things you're going to need to do is you're going to be need to be able to say, hey, I recognize that that zone is broken, but I'm pretty sure that it's not broken by some bad guy doing something bad, and I really need my users to still be able to get to it. So before negative trust anchors were implemented, it was necessary to completely disable DNSSEC validation to allow a single broken zone to be provided to the client. So because NASA.gov broke their DNSSEC, you needed to turn off all DNSSEC validation for every single zone in the DNS. Well, that obviously isn't very good. So what a negative trust anchor allows you to do is to provide the ability to break the chain of trust and therefore allow what would be considered bogus DNSSEC signed zones to be provided to your client as non-authenticated data. So in this case, I have say, you know, NASA.gov, they, they broke their resigning, something went badly wrong. I know that it wasn't 
you know, it's not just somebody attacking my users or not somebody attacking them. So I'm going to insert a negative trust anchor. It's going to basically pretend that there is no DS record in the parent. So at that point, my bind server says, oh, look, there's a gap in the chain. So I'm not able to do guaranteed validation from here on down. So I'm going to go ahead and allow data to pass back through, but I'm not going to mark it as bogus and I'm not going to set the AD bit. So NTAs, the negative trust anchors are non-permanent. The idea is not for you to go in and say, I think that this is going to be broken forever, click, boom, and then forget about it and then have the user of that zone fix their stuff, but your negative trust anchor still be, um, uh, you know, your negative trust anchor still be there in, uh, uh, you know, implemented. You don't want that to occur because once the, you know, once the owner of that zone fixes their stuff, then you want to start validating again. So again, NTAs have a one hour default. The hope is that the bad zone is going to be fixed and it's going to require intervention on the behalf of the recursive server to renew that NTA. So at the end of that one hour, you're going to say, okay, fine, set it for another hour or set it for two hours, you know, but you don't want to say set it forever. Uh, you're actually able to set it for, I, I want to say it's a two week period. It may be one week. It's on the next slide or the next two slides from here but you are able to lengthen it from one hour to a little bit longer in relative terms. And therefore you're going to be able to set these things not quite as often. Now, if a zone begins to validate correctly, then even before the expiration date of the NTA, it's going to automatically expire. Now, you may run into situations, and I've seen this, where someone is working on a zone, so it'll work for about 10 minutes, and then it won't work, and then it'll work, and then it won't work, and that gets really tiring having to continually reinsert the negative trust anchor. So in that case, there is an option on the negative trust anchors to mark this negative trust anchor as forced. So this is saying that even if this zone is able to be validated, or if the DS record in the parent vanishes, I don't care. I want that negative trust anchor to be in place because my guess is that within the hour or within the you know two hours, it's going to go bogus again. It's going to be bad, and therefore, you know, I just want to say, you know, even if it comes back, let it ride. We're gonna we're gonna wait out the uh, NTA's timer. So NTAs are controlled through the RNDC command because they are real time. They're things that you're interacting with the name server. They're not something you're putting into your configuration file. You have the options of RNDC NTA dump, which is going to show you all of the existing trust anchors that bind has in place. NTA and then given a domain is going to create a negative trust anchor. Here you can give it a dash lifetime and give it a length of time. And again, you can use the dash force to say, make this stick for that length of time, even if it is able to be validated. And then you're also able to say in a specific view. So if you're using multiple views and you only want the NTA to appear in a specific view, then you need to specify the view name. Then you also have the ability to do an NTA-remove, and that is going to allow you to get rid of an existing negative trust anchor. And this is going to allow you to get rid of it before it is, you know, uh, but before bind recognizes that it's able to be validated and takes it out automatically, or the la lifetime um, uh, uh, comes around. So in this way, you're able to remove an existing NTA. So what does this look like when we're, we're actually doing it? Well, in this case, I run an RNDC NTA dash dump, and I just get back an immediate prompt, which shows that I have no currently existing NTAs. 
Now, if for whatever reason I find out that isc.org is not able to be validated, it's, it's failing its DNSSEC validation, then what I'm able to do is RNDC, MTA, and then the name of the zone that I want to insert the negative trust anchor into. So in this case, what I'm going, and, and you'll notice that the underscore default is the view into which this trust anchor has been inserted. So now when I do a dig of isc.org plus DNSSEC plus multi, what I normally would see is in the flags field, I would see the AD flag. I would see uh, the, the authenticated data flag. But in this case, because I have an NTA installed, I do not see the AD flag. Now, this would be the case where if I did a dig on, on isc.org prior to doing the NTA, I would have gotten a server fail because the validation would not be working correctly. I would then you know, go out and talk to the isc.org folks and say, hey, why is this happening? Are you aware of it? Oh yeah, we know we're working on fixing that, but it's gonna take us a little bit. I'm gonna insert the negative trust anchor. My users are then, instead of getting the serve fail, they're gonna get back the answer, but without the AD bit. So now I run the RNDC MTA dash dump, and I see that one hour after uh, the, uh, uh, actually this is, yeah. Uh, one hour after the uh, key was, uh, or the, uh, uh, the NTA was inserted is when it's going to expire. But then if I wait a short time, I'm able to do an RNDC NTA dash dump again. And you will see that in this case, there is, uh, that it expired all on its own prior to the one hour expiration time because bind was able to do the validation and because it was able to do the validation and I had not forced bind to keep that NTA around, it automatically expired when bind discovered that it was able to be validated. So that's pretty much automation of rollovers and the NTAs. So with that, what I'd like to do is open it up to questions and comments and uh, let's, let's go for it. Okay, um, we have a bunch of questions. Uh, many of them, um, Matthias has answered, uh, you know, in the background while you were going, but I think we should uh, go through them uh, so that everybody can follow along. Um, uh, so there are questions both in the chat panel and in the Q&A. So I'm just going to start over in the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> John was asking, um, if the parent and the child are both using Bind, uh, are there any plans to automate the transfer of the DS key? Um, so I will I, leave that to my dice. Yeah, okay. Assuming he's here. Yes, uh, trying to find the right window. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, the thing that already exists is, uh, as I said earlier, uh, the child zone, the zone that you're assigning will publish CDS and CDNS key records uh, as soon as that's uh, needed. And it's needed when the DS needs to be published. Uh, there is no feature and there is no plans yet to have a parent zone pull for those CDS or CDNS key records. Um, I remember that there was uh, a whole debate about this in the ITF. I know Mark was really in favor of doing this and um, you know there was some pushback uh, but I don't know do you know if if um, the, the, the pushback on this is because uh, it's policy uh, right. you you interact with your registry through a registrar so um, you have to sort of get the DS to him and he will say to the registry hey the child zone will ha want to have this record in your parent zone uh, and uh, because of this policy there's a pushback technically it's uh, possible and so it would be possible technically if you run both the parent and child zone to to 
just publish the DS record because if you own the parent zone. Uh, you you see that JP is that. suggesting that if it's logged um, explicitly, then uh, there might be sort of a quick and dirty way of doing this. Did, did you see that comment there? Um, I didn't see that comment yet, but th there is definitely you can tool around this uh, by making a script that digs for the CDS and CDNS key records. And if, they're, uh, if you can find them, uh, derive the DS record and put it in a parent zone. Uh, so I, I think the tooling is doable. Um, and hence, I think there are no plans yet for putting this logic into MAME-D. Do you know if it's logged specifically, the uh, CDS, uh, CDNS key publication, if that's explicitly logged? Uh, I don't think it's ex explicitly logged, although if that helps with tooling, it will be easy to add. Okay, so um, maybe I'll just interject with a public service announcement that uh, anybody is free to go to the Bind GitLab and open an issue requesting a feature. This sounds like it might be a good feature request. Um, so um, we're just going to go over to the, um, to the questions in the chat. Um, so the first question, um, Ralph had asked, uh, when a key file is auto-deleted from the zone, is the key file itself left intact? Right, so, so that is the, the dash uppercase D, the deletion time. And uh, as Matthijs said here, um, the only thing that is actually done in this case is it is not published. So the key files still remain on the drive. The, you know, we, don't, we don't actually go out and delete the files. What is being deleted is the data that is being published. So you will no longer have that DNS key resource record in the DNS key resource record set. So the data is still available to you, but it's not visible to the outside world. Okay. <clears throat> um, let's see. So uh, there was a question uh, from Luis. Um, uh, why didn't we support NSEC3 from the beginning? Um, Matthijs has already um, answered that in the chat, saying that um, he just didn't have time to get it ready for the 9.16.0 release, and uh, he's planning to add it in 9.17, which is the current development branch, and then uh, subsequently backport it to 9.16. <clears throat> um, so I guess that is a, it's coming. Um, uh, Luis also asks, um, uh, I would think that this plays nicely with the HSM enabled bind and um, Matthias has already answered that yes, this should work um, with uh, an HSM. Um, Andreas is asking, um, what happens if the state files get lost? I um, also replied that in the chat, uh, what happens? Uh, first of all, don't touch them, back them up. <laughs> and if you run a, uh, if you accidentally remove the state files uh, and bind is still running, uh, the, those files will be rewritten again whenever there's a change. So uh, with any luck, you will be re it will automatically recover. Uh, however, if you restart bind and those state files are missing, um, what sort of happens is that um, it will look like that you will transfer from an existing uh, keys that already signed the zone uh, to the new DNSSEC policy. Uh, the logic there is it, it looks at the timing data which are available in the private file and in the key file as well. Uh, and try to derive the correct state from it. So if a, a key is published, for example, for already for a year, I mean, for a long time, um, we can guess that it is present for a long time and the ca uh, resolvers will also know about this key. So we'll set the uh, state to what is called omnipresent, known to the whole world. But if the publish time is just now, uh, then it is likely not published long enough that all resolvers will know about it. So then the state will be set to 
rumored, uh, which is okay, it is published, but maybe not all resolvers know about it. So if you remove the st state files and you restart bind, uh, chances are that it will uh, work uh, correctly. Um, I do have to mention that there is a, a bug on uh, initializing that uh, those states, um, and that is fixed in the next release, 9.16.2. So, so Matthias, I think you should say what the bug is. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the bug is the bug is uh, where indeed where you have uh, existing keys. Um, and you want to make, uh, to transfer to uh, using DNSSEC policy. So you change your configuration and use DNSSEC policy. Um, it doesn't look at those timing metadata yet. And so it will just think that you're signing from scratch. So the transfer from existing auto DNSSEC maintained to DNSSEC policy is, not as you would hope it will be in 9.16.0 and 9.16.1. Okay, I just wanted you to be explicit because it's a you know it's pretty surprising. It basically wipes out what you had previously and kind of starts over. So people just need to be aware of that. Yes, this was a a, a, a bad omission in the known issues for this uh, feature. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Uh, Skipping down, um, Alex is saying, uh, back on the key rotation, since the expired keys are not changed on the file system, does Bind take care of removing expired key entries off the zone file after the expiration is reached, rotating the zone to notify slaves of the change? So there's a couple of questions in there. Um, yeah, so so um, when you say expired, um, we're, we're talking about, I'm assuming the deletion, uh, the, the dash uppercase D option, the deletion time. And once that, um, the, the, that dash D time occurs, the keen material will not show up in the zone. So again, uh, a, an event will have occurred that says, hey, it's time to delete this key from the zone. The key data will be deleted from the DNS key resource record set. The zone, uh, the serial number will be incremented. The zone will be re-signed using the correct keys and that key will no longer appear in the zone. So I think that that, I, I think that, that answers the question. Right, since the SOA is updated, the, the slaves will be notified and that change will propagate. I think that was correct. what the question was about. Okay, so here's a question from, uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, Jorg. Uh, anyway, does an NTA survive a bind restart? I don't know. I'm I'm going to make the assumption that the answer is yes. Uh, Matthijs, do you do you know uh, for certain? Unfortunately, the answer is no for me as well. Oh. That I don't oh. know for certain. Alan gets it wrong. That's it, guys. No, 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 sorry, sorry. That's it. I'm I, done. I don't know for certain as well. That's so. Alex has commented in the bottom. And he says it does. Thank you, but I'm not sure if it, that was uh, <laughs> answering that question or answering something else. So anyway, I won't take that as an answer. So um, we'll put that on the we're not sure at the moment. Right, and we'll, I'll definitely find it. And so that gives you a reason to come back next week. So next week, I will have the answer to that question. Does, does a, an NTA uh, survive a bind restart? So, so we have a segue into next week. Uh, okay, all right. So, um, Let's keep going. Um, so I added a comment um, just with a link to a feature added in 916 validate accept, which is equivalent to a permanent NTA. Um, that I expect does, does survive, but I guess we should look at that as well. It uh, does survive a restart. So here's a question from Luis. Um, uh, will the NTA, I think he's referring to the NTA, still be listed in the dash dump output? Oh no. Uh, Sorry, no, it's probably not about an NTA. It will still be listed in the dash dump output until after expiration, right? So I think this is talking about the uh, the key material. No, that's that. Well, no, the key material we don't we don't have anything that uses dash dump. So I'm gonna, I'm going to guess back to the NTA. Okay. Uh, 
So um, it's going, I honestly, okay, so this is a feature that is one of those features that is really cool, but I don't know the answer. So now we have two reasons to come back next week. Okay. All right. Yeah. So he's, he was, he clarified at the bottom. Um, he was talking about RND CNTA dash dump. Okay. So a uh, couple of questions about NTAs. This is a hot topic. Um, uh, Francisco comments it'd be awesome to have an NTA zone that could be trusted with a list of widely known operation problems like NASA, for example, which is the <laughs> example everybody always uses. Um, and then the bind operator can have a mechanism to trust the desired source, similar to what RPZ does. Uh, he's referring there to whitelisting um, some RPZ zones. And I think that's what this validate accept feature is for. Um, uh, because as I said, it is kind of like a permanent NTA. Uh, it's a don't validate these zones. Um, <clears throat> So here's a comment uh, from Andreas. An NTA could be used for an attack, right? A hijack or a resolver, run RNDC, and do cache poisoning. Uh, yeah, it could, but if you're already owning the, well, if if you yeah, if you own the the path between the consumer and the and the validating recursive server, or you own the validating recursive server, you're there anyway. Um, you're, because the, unless it is actually being validated on the client, the only thing that the client even knows is, gee, I got a serve fail. If, you know, it doesn't validate, it doesn't even most likely know anything about the AD bit. But yeah, I mean, it could be, but it's just, it's just another, it's, it's another thing that you could do if you own the last mile. Right, he's got an additional comment at the bottom saying the resolver would still be validating the rest of the world except for yep. this one zone, and it would be hard to be noticed. And, sure. and so this is, this is uh, obviously is a real problem with Dina second general that the end user typically doesn't have any idea what's going on and you know we're sort of trusting the resolver in this case to uh, you know, do the right thing for the end user. Um, you know when it's your network access provider who's providing the resolver, um, you know you already have some uh, trust is required there. So here's a question from Bob. Um, whoops. Uh, sorry, every time somebody types something, it scrolls away, and I lost it. <laughs> No, I'm going to do a denial of service against Vicky. Oh, okay. For all your subzones under your main zone, does CASP handle the DS records in the parent zone? Um, it doesn't handle the parent at this point. So that's that's what uh, Matthias was saying has is not on the schedule right now. Is actually taking that CDS or CDNS key and importing it or or somehow managing it in the parent. So that's going to be one of the things that you're going to need to do manually at this point um, or like Vicky said, go in and, you know, open up a, uh, a Git request that says, hey, we really, really want this and it would be really cool. Right. If we're counting votes, here's another one from Ian, uh, basically for the same thing. It would be interesting to provide support for automatic maintenance of the KSK when the parent and child are on the same bind server. Um, if there's the same server, there's uh, or even different servers, but they're both running bind. Um, so let's see. So uh, we do also have uh, somebody, I love it. I love it when um, people in the audience answer questions. <laughs> and somebody, I don't know who uh, B. Hilton, what his first name is, but, uh, or her first name, just tried the NTA across bind restarts and it does recover the NTA. So we have a experimental validation. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so I think that's all the questions that I see. I think we've got them all. Um, uh, Jim asked if, if NTA is a 9.16 feature and um, I answered yes, but I mean, it's not new with 9.16. Um, I'm not sure if we added them in 9.12, I think in 9.12. Anyway, they've been around for a while, but we have, uh, you know, over time added, um, added additional features, added additional logging and this new, uh, sort of uh, NT validate accept is new for 916. 
Um, so it uh, looks like the, maybe the last question, um, will this session recording be posted on YouTube um, by this or by next week? So typically it takes me like a, a day and a half to post them. Um, so usually I have them up by Friday. Um, absolutely, it'll be up on YouTube and it will also be up at the uh, presentations link on the ISC website. So, so I'm not going to actually do it, but I'm, I'm really disappointed that nobody said go back to slide 21 and explain it. But oh. I'm, I'm going to move forward now. <laughs> um, we do have one more question. Um, and you, then we can go back to slide 21. I think probably most people here know what that is. But, um, but just in case everybody doesn't, maybe we should at least tell them what it is. So there's another question I didn't see, sorry, from John, that uh, JP has already um, <laughs> responded to. Um, uh, sorry, it's just another request for automatic parent updating. And JP has entered an issue. If you look under, under the q and I hope everybody can see this answer with a link to an issue in GitLab. And anybody else who is already a GitLab user, if you click on that, you can vote for it. Um, <laughs> go ahead and vote it up. So Alan, if you want to switch back to that um, algorithm, you could at least tell people what it is. I don't have any idea what it is. This is something that showed up at the all hands meeting uh, a year ago. And uh, they said, here's how CASP works. And then we went on to another slide. And I, you know, I, I don't know. Matthias knows what it is. <laughs> um, yeah, so this by itself doesn't tell you very much, though. Uh, there is a paper, uh, if you really would like to know, uh, it's about seven pages uh, you could read, uh, which explains the logic of this. And this is the logic, basically, that proves uh, how to transition uh, keys and it states, uh, without breaking the chain of trust. Um, uh, if you follow these rules, uh, then you are not doing any actions, for example, accidentally removing a key, um, uh, which uh, results in validation errors for your zone. And I was completely, I was completely joking about anybody really, you know, as, as Matthijs said, there, this is documented in, in a white paper that is available and we'll be, we'll be happy to get you the link to that. Uh, but this is, this is the kind of thing that I think that the ISC engineers do for fun and it just blows my mind. So congratulations on yet again, blowing my mind. And uh, I see that uh, Jan Piet uh, says it looks like a recipe for a very strong alcoholic beverage. If you're going to read that paper, I can recommend you drinking one of those with it. Okay, well, I think we have uh, addressed all the questions um, uh, uh, with thanks to uh, uh, people who tested while we were online. Um, so thanks a lot, uh, Alan, for this uh, next to last uh, webinar in the series. And thank you very much, Matthijs, for joining and uh, handling all these questions. So we'll see uh, hopefully many of you next week. And I hope we have a little bit better luck with the audio next week. Oh, and uh, Matthijs has actually just uh, put a link in the chat, if anybody wants to know, to the paper that explains this uh, algorithm. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring donuts for everybody that shows up at my place next week. So, hey, Alan, you want to give people a quick update on your boat? Uh, hey, my boat's in the water. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, uh, I actually live on a sailboat. And uh, as of, uh, so for the last year and three months, it has been up in a boat yard. And uh, it has been, I've been doing work on it, replacing the engine, doing a lot of other uh, mechanical and, and other fixes. And so I am back in the water and uh, it, is, it is a good thing. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not at the boat at this moment, but uh, I, I may very well do the uh, presentation from the boat next week just to say that I did it. Oh. Have a wonderful week. Thank you very much for attending. And uh, we will see you next week for the one and last episode of DNSX stuff. 
Have a wonderful week. Stay safe. Keep your hands washed.